Hello everyone and welcome to Grid Tonight, your weekly motorsports news program. I'm Adam Limerys and with me as always is Kobe Lambeth from the Podium Finish. And a special shout out to our awesome Patreon supporters, Colin, Mark, Robin, and Shell. Thank you for investing in Grid Network. We'll link to our Patreon in the video description below. And please feel free to comment in the chat room tonight and ask any questions. Tonight we'll discuss huge news came up coming from Hunko's Hollinger Racing. The possibility of more new winners in the NASCAR Cup Series. Matt White's great history update and Scott McLaughlin being rewarded after a dominant Portland win. We'll start out discussing a growing IndyCar team for 2023. Yes, and earlier today, Hunko's Hollinger Race announced they'll expand their NGT IndyCar Series program in 2023. With Callum Milot returning to number 77 Chevrolet, Hunko's will also fill a second full-time entry, the number 78. This team has taken a huge step forward this year with Ilot as the only single-car team running the entire season. Ilot's qualified inside the top 12 five times, qualifying as high as seventh at the IMS Road Course in the streets of Toronto. His best finish this season was eighth at the IMS Road Course in the spring, and he got his second career top 10 last weekend in the Grand Prix of Portland. Hunko's Hollinger Racing has been setting the stage for this expansion for a while now, running the last three races of 2021 to prepare for a full season this year. Now one year of overachieving with a young British driver who has a lot of potential in the future, and the team is growing. Photo courtesy of Hunko's Hollinger Racing. Adam, do you agree with their decision to add another car to their Indy car lineup at this time? I sure do, Kobe. Carl Mylott has proved this year he is a force to be reckoned with in the future. And this move today by, by Hunko's Hollinger Racing, gotta say, I love it. And there's so much possibilities of which driver could join Colin Mylott in the number 78 car next year. So I absolutely love this move. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think it's a, a great move for, for them to expand to two cars. And it's really nice to see how Brad Hollinger and Ricardo Hunkos have been slowly building out this program j j just like last, last year coming to the IndyCar series, well, returning to the IndyCar series for Hunkos, trying to trying to get, prepare for a full season this year, doing it the right way instead of just bringing in two cars just like that and being slow. They decided to, you know, get their, is get the team together at the end of 2021, make sure that, make sure to get everybody running, starting the chemistry early in 2021, come around, try to do the best you can, what you have. And they've really improved that program a lot throughout the season. Now, now, now Cal, Cal and Mila is certainly going to be, it seems like it's going to be con contending for top tens now, week in and week out, and, and maybe it could get even better in, in the future. And now since they have a strong base with Callum, now they decided that it's best to add a second team. And I feel like the timing is absolutely right for them to be able to do that. And when it comes to the driver market, that will surely be a lot of interest from veterans and young drivers looking to make a name for themselves. With I love being a young driver himself, it might be beneficial for Hunko's Hollinger Racing to bring in a veteran with IndyCar experience to mentor I lot, similar to what Ryan Hunter Ray's been doing with him this year. A seasoned veteran can help improve a program and provide the type of feedback that an inexperienced driver cannot. There's also a lot of Indy lights and F2 drivers looking to advance their careers, and an IndyCar seat will surely interest many of them. Should the team hire a veteran or a rookie to drive the number 78 Chevrolet? Well, Colby, I think it sh should be a veteran, and I like what Ryan Hunter Ray is doing this year. And, and to me, you get someone with experience in an open wheel car who can go out there and and may not contend for wins right away, but at least get top fives and top tens, so the pressure isn't on Colin every single weekend you get someone who can compete on the ovals the road courses and street courses so so next year you you can see 
both the number seven, both, both Hunko's Hollander racing cars getting top fives and top tens. And we have a comment here in the chat room from our own Joe Sam Diego saying that he'd like to see a rookie from Indy Lights or if a veteran, a one year deal because I lot is almost there and in, 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 in experience. It will, it will be interesting if they decide to go with the rookie, Joe. There's there's certainly quite a few rookies in Indy Light Series right now who who I believe certainly could make the jump up to IndyCar and do a really good job. But but I, but I have a feeling that they're gonna go with with with, with a veteran here. Callum Callum has certainly has a bright future, and if they can make this program as 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 good as they think it can be, they might they, they might be able to build around Callum I lot and make him and make him the lead driver of this of this team and, be, and eventually become a team that can start contending for wins on a weekly basis and maybe if maybe if they're lucky become a championship caliber organization. But that's something that probably is going to happen more more long term so i so i think a veteran would be the right way to, to go here and there's certainly quite a quite a few veterans who are going to be on the market in the indy car series and one and one driver that i'm looking at who who might who looking like it might be out of arrow mclaren sp and may not be going to formula e i think it would be a really impressive thing if they were able to bring in someone like a felix rosenquist to help to, to help that program i know i know that would certainly be a step down from Aaron McLaren SP, but Felix really wants to stay in the NTT IndyCar series, and it doesn't seem like there are that many seats open right now that would be available to Felix, but who knows what could happen. But if they were able to get an IndyCar veteran like that, add it to their program who can provide the, the, the feedback, have more, have a little bit more experience than I lot, I think that will cert certainly help. And it seems like Ron Hunter Ray, who's been, who was mentoring Callum I lot during the, during, during the month of May at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, it seems like he's going to be really busy with Chip Ganassi's sports car racing program as they continue to develop that Cadillac LMDH. So it's certainly going to be interesting to see what Hunko's Hollinger Racing does with their driver with their driver in the number 78 Chevrolet in 2023. Next, here's Joe San Diego speaking to Callum Milot last weekend at Portland International Raceway about his 2022 season and what he looks forward to next year. Callum, welcome back to Portland. Last year when we chatted, about to enter your first race, how will you rate everything so far since last year in Portland? Yeah, it's been a it's been a while. It's been a roller coaster, I'd say. Um, didn't really know what I was getting myself in for at the end of last year, but it's come a long way. Teams come a long way. I think we should be on for a good weekend. Now you mentioned teams come a long way. 2023 plan is already underway. How excited are you about next year? Especially going to be coming back to a lot more tracks again, potentially a second car. How's everything all shaping up? Yeah, it's good. I mean, it, it would be nice to right the wrongs of this year when you know you could have done a better job. Um, but I think, yeah, coming in with the way the team is, I think we should have a second car. So that will make everything interesting and make it easier, my life a little bit easier as a, as a team to, to help them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's nice to relax and uh, I can focus a bit more on the smaller things. So. Now, last year, I remember while we were all here in Portland, you had folks from Chevrolet coming, introducing you. Welcome to the Chevrolet family. Of course, all the differences of racing in the United States. How have you enjoyed racing in the United States? And what was some of the biggest adjustments, especially from racing in Europe? It's been an eye-opener. I think one of the main things that I've started to realize is it's been back-to-back -back every weekend. We haven't had a massive amount of breaks, which... Uh, it's something to get used to, but a bit different. I think in the American racing as well, it's, it's tough racing. It's hard, it's long, um, very competitive out here. You've got a lot of good drivers. Uh, and yeah, I think just having a bit more patience in some circumstances helps a lot. Uh, something I need to learn, you know, being young, I, I was always pushing 110% to try and make everything happen. And that's not the way you need to be. Now, have any of your colleagues that you used to race against in Europe, have they called like, hey, how is this IndyCar and even express interest in coming? Yeah, there's a lot that have asked and um, are definitely interested in the way it works. There's a few that, or one or two that might make the commitment, um, but there's a, there's a, there's been a lot of interest, but I don't know how many of them are going to go, you know, okay, I want to do it. It's not as well known, and when I say well known, I don't mean everyone knows IndyCar, but uh, it's like not as well understood. So people want to understand what it's like, what the racing's like, how it works politically, the deals and all of that. And it's just something that that side is quite unknown. And so they're asking, yeah, and there was a lot of interest and they see it as a, as a good option, but it's a big jump for a lot of people. 
and one big jump we know the ovals overall you feel pretty comfortable with the ovals and it's still an area of, of a lot of learning or do you feel like you're getting the hang of it pretty well i think the short ovals i've got a good hang of it um we had great results at iowa gateway the race pace was good unfortunately i made a mistake in the pit stop um but the speedway i think i've still got a lot to learn there i think setting up the car and finding my feet on that side is it's a big thing and a long thing and especially with only one car in the team there was nothing to really chase or look at or understand so everything was off of me and i had no idea in that sense of what i was doing um so yeah i, I think when we put all of that together next year it will be the biggest area of improvement hopefully and then for your expectations for this week, I know last year the race was a little short with mechanical issue. What are you anticipating for Portland? Yeah, we, we had a good weekend last year, considering all the little issues we had. I, I mean, I could I could list it uh, <laughs> very long. But um, yeah, I think putting that all together, uh, we had a good race weekend last year. And I think with the way the car is this year, should be, I, I, I think we can push for our best result. Callum, thank you so much for your time. Best of luck to you. Thank you very much. And we have a comment from our own Joe Samiego who says Felix would would be a good fit in my opinion. If he wants to help build a team up, I would lean towards Sebastian Bourdais as a veteran option. Joe, I like I like what I agree with you. Uh, Sebastian Bourdais has a lot of IndyCar experience, uh, so that's a good option as well. Now, to some news from the Indy Light Series, Cape Motorsports is, is moving up to, to Indy Lights in 2023, and they're taking one of their USF 2000 drivers with them. After finishing fourth in the championship standings this year and earning USF 2000 Rookie of the Year honors. Jagger Jones will graduate to Indy Lights next year. Jones scored one USF 2000 win at Barber Motorsports Park in Alabama. Won three poles and stood on the podium five times. He's not only a talented race car driver with the goal of reaching the NDT IndyCar Series, but he's smart too. He's on the Dean's List High Point University in North Carolina. Coming from USF 2000 to Indy Lights can be quite a transition with the USF 2000 car having 175 horsepower versus 400 horse versus 450 horsepower in the Indy Lights car. However, that's not expected to be a major issue for Jones since he has experience driving higher horsepower when he raced stock cars. In 2019, he raced in the Arkham Art Series West. He finished second in the championship that year and won a race at All-American Speedway in Roseville, California. Since then, his stock car opportunities have dried up. So, he's focused on open wheel racing for now and looking to add to his family's legacy. You see, Jagger Jones is the son of TJ Jones and the grandson of former Indy 500 champion Parnelli Jones. And the what do you see on the screen? Courtesy of USF 2000. And next, Kobe and I are going are going are going to discuss 17 different winners in the NASCAR Cup Series in 2022. And before we get to that, Adam, got two more comments in the chat room. What One saying, Jared Hildebrand would be great, in your opinion. Either way, you're excited for them to expand, and I think this will really help their growth. I lot as a rising star. Totally agree with you. I think Callum Milo has potential to be a superstar in the NTT IndyCar Series who can eventually become one of the top drivers in IndyCar competing for wins and championship for quite a handful of years to come. I think Jared Hildebrand will be extremely beneficial for I lot on the oval track since since I since the ovals are certainly you know I lot's biggest room for for improvement. So having someone like Jared Hildebrand helping I lot on the ovals that would be extremely important for his development. And he also said Sebastian Bourdais would also be great. And you hope Felix finds a way to stay in this series as a class set and really fast. As for Sebastian Bourdais right now, it seems like 
he he's acknowledged that his IndyCar days are over and he probably would not come back on a full time basis unless you know it was unless he he, he just tried to come in and substitute when whenever. But Bordet seems perfectly comfortable now with his post IndyCar career and moving on to sports car racing full time. But yeah, Felix Rosenquist he's made it perfectly clear that he doesn't want to go to McLaren's former lead program. He wants to stay in IndyCar. Whether or not it is all going to depend with if he stays with Aaron McLaren SB on what happens with Alex Below. I know we just talked about over the weekend a development that from Jenna Fryer from Associated Press saying that McLaren is now willing to buy out Alex Below's contract, which would bring him to the Aaron McLaren SP Indy car team, which would put Felix Rosenquist out. But I'm sure Felix is, you know, trying very hard to to find a spot to stay in the Indy car series. And this very well could be a great place for him to go to a program that's currently on the rise. And now switching gears to NASCAR, after Eric Jones won at Darlington, he became the 17th different winner this year in the NASCAR Cup Series. In 2001, the series saw an extreme level of parity, a year that produced 19 different winners. With nine races remaining this season, NASCAR might be able to tie that number with just two more different winners. Looking at the tracks remaining and the drivers who still haven't won this year, reaching 19 different winners might not be out of the realm of possibility. Ryan Blaney's in the playoffs, but he hasn't won a points race yet. Martin Truex Jr., he almost won at Darlington. Until, until his engine let him down, he could really win at any of the remaining tracks, especially Kansas this upcoming weekend, Bristol, Texas, Las Vegas, Homestead, Martinsville, or Phoenix. Lots of good tracks there for Martin Truex Jr. And he, he's obviously very disappointed about not making the playoffs on a win, but send a statement. Don't forget about me. I'm still in it to win it, regardless of my playoff status or lack thereof. Last time, NASCAR raced at Kansas, Kurt Busch won. Now, Bubba Wallace driving a number 45 Toyota. Wallace has performed at a much higher level in the second half of the season. If he keeps that up, he could possibly take take a win this weekend at Kansas and contend at many of the other tracks left on the schedule, especially at Talladega. RFK racing is slowly but surely improving their program. So look for Chris Buescher to be strong at the Charlotte Roval and Brad Keselowski at Talladega. Really, any of those any of the drivers who haven't won this year can win at Talladega. Michael McDowell has also run well, not just at the road courses like usual, but he's shown a lot of speed. On the ovals, too, he might still win when you least expect it. Eric Almarola, Justin Haley, Cole Custer, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., Harrison Burton, Ty Dillon, Todd Gillen, Corla Joy, and Cody Ware are the other full-time drivers who are still looking to win a race in 2022. And the photo you see on the screen, courtesy of Jarrett C. Tilton from Getty Images. Adam, do you see the 2022 NASCAR Cup Series season rival in 2001 and reach 19 different winners? Or could they even do one better by reaching 20? We don't typically see many non-playoff drivers win playoff races. Kobe, I am surprised Ryan Blady, Mark Jarex Jr., and Bubba Wallace have not found their way to victory lane. They have been so close so many times. And I just got a funny feeling that those three drivers are going to end up in victory lane before the season's over. First of all, let's take a look at Ryan Blaney. He has been so good at places we're going to. You think about you think about the short tracks. Bristol, Martinsville. He could win there. And of course we of course anybody can win at Talladega. Um Martin Turks Jr. I I he could win this weekend in Kansas. He could he could win the races at Bristol, Martinsville. You mentioned Las Vegas, Homestead, Phoenix. He could he could score himself a couple wins before the season's over with. And Bubba Wallace, well, when we get to Talladega, who is the defending champion? Yeah. Even though it was rain short last year. He's been good on the super speedways, so I wouldn't be surprised if Bubba Wallace does really good at Talladega, and you never can count out Michael McDowell. I mean, Michael McDowell, he can win at the Charlotte Roval. He, he could win at Talladega. I mean, he won the Daytona 500, so I think we're going to, I think we're going to, exceed 19 different winners i even think we're gonna see 20 i went um so these next races before the end of the season i think we're gonna see some faces we haven't seen in victory lane 
yet this year find their way to take the checkered flag this year and i think looking at all the different tracks that are still remaining on a schedule it, it's like the perfect storm to get up there to 19 different winners obviously ryan blaney is a playoff driver in the playoffs so I, I, it wouldn't surprise me to see Ryan Blaney go to victory lane and Martin Truex Jr. ran a really strong race at Darlington until, in, until his engine let go, proved prove, prove that he doesn't care that he's not in a championship hunt, that he's still going to go out there and try to win each week. So I certainly think we could see a Martin Truex Jr. victory. I just listed all the different tracks, Adam, that he could win at basically almost every single track that's remaining in the playoff schedule, minus Talladega, which, you know, had a, had a lot of up and down love in the super speedways, mostly down. And then Toyota, they've been nowhere on the road course. So I definitely wouldn't pick him to win at the Charlotte Roval this year because for some reason, Toyota's road course program is not that good in 2022. So there are a lot of opportunities for Truex to win right, as well for Ryan Blaney. And then and then if you those assuming those two win, then, you know, you'd be at 19 different winners. And then you have... And then you have Talladega to throw into the equation, which is a major wild card. And you could get your 20th different winner right there. You think about Bubba Wallace, who won last year. He could do it. Brad Keselowski, Chris Bush, or RFK build some fast forward Mustangs for those super speedways. Michael McDowell also runs really well in the speedways. So I think we very well could be heading towards the perfect storm to get 19 different winners or surprisingly 20. But I think 20 is, you know, it could be the absolute max that we could see. I don't see us getting a 21st different winner. That would be really, really insane, but still it's insane in the fact that we're talking about 17 different winners right now because in my lifetime, I haven't seen this at all at all in NASCAR competition, so it's really cool to see. And now it's shifting gears to, over to Formula 2. After last weekend's Formula 2 races at Zandvoort, Roy Nassani picked up enough penalty points for a race weekend ban. Dams decided to turn to Formula 2 veteran Luca Giotto to replace Nassani this week in at Monza in the Italian driver's home race. Giotto raced in GP2 in 2016, then Formula 2 from 2017 through 2020, picking up multiple race victories, so his experience is valued. He said he's excited to compete in his home Grand Prix weekend at the Temple of Speed. Since then, Giotto's been competing in sports car racing, GT World Challenge Europe, and the photo you see on the screen, courtesy of Dams. Next, here's Matt White with a grid history update. Hey, Matt White here. Time for that uh, portion of the show where we take a swing around the motorsports landscape from the weekend and bring you up to speed with all the results that you may have missed. The playoffs for this thing have started. The NASCAR Cup Series Championship headed to Darlington over the weekend for the first of the playoff races, and it was won by a non-playoff driver, Eric Jones, getting the win on Sunday in the Southern 500 for Petty GMS. Terrific fight to the flag in the Xfinity race on Saturday, won by Noah Gregson. They've got a couple more weeks to go in Xfinity before their playoff begins, heading to Kansas for the Cup Series this weekend. Two-wheeled action was in Italy at Mazzano for the San Marino, Riviera and Rimini Grand Prix. And for the fourth MotoGP race in a row, Francesco Bagnaia took the flag. He was on course to win that race, of course, last year in the late laps before falling off and handing the championship to Fabio Quattararo. This year, he's piling the pressure on the Yamaha rider with that fourth win in a row, heading to Aragon in a couple of weeks, which should probably suit them. As well, he won there last season. In Moto2, Alonso Lopez got his first Grand Prix victory of his career. And an emotional one it was too. And in Moto3, Dennis Foggia won for the third year in a row at Misano in the Moto3 class. And uh, he is keeping himself in championship contention in Moto3. At Zandvoort, big weekend in Holland. And a big win for Max Verstappen. What Talking about one hands on trophies. That's one for Max. He's now pretty much, well, he's pretty much clear, isn't he, now in the Formula 1 World Championship with that victory, second in a row on home soil. Supporting the Grand Prix were F2 and F3. In F2, Marcus Armstrong got the win on Saturday afternoon after Formula 1 qualifying, and Felipe Djugovic getting his one hand on the F2 Championship with a win on Sunday morning in a safety car strewn. F2 feature race in Formula 3, Kyle Collette and Zane Maloney were the winners, Zane getting his second feature race win in as many weeks after winning at Spa last Sunday. Terrific job from the whole team over the weekend, has to be said, here at the Grid Network. We'll give ourselves a pat on the back for our coverage of the IndyCar Grand Prix of Portland. Joe was on site and we did a great job, all of us, I have to say, in covering what was a tremendous weekend. One in the IndyCar race, tremendously, in dominating fashion by Scott McLaughlin. He took home his third win of the season. There were some champions crowned over the weekend. In USF 2000, Jace Denmark got a race win. Mac Clark got a race win. And Michael Diorlando got the all-important race win 
in that tremendous third race to take home the championship. So congratulations to him. And Indy Pro 2000, Louis Foster won the first race of the weekend. Rhys Gold won the other two, but it wasn't enough to stop Louis Foster taking home the championship in Indy Pro 2000. So congratulations to both of those guys. Indy Lights will support IndyCar at Laguna Seca for two more races to crown their champion. They had one race at Portland. It was won by Benjamin Pedersen. One grid endurance performance index race over the weekend, and it was at Hockenheim for GT World Challenge Europe. One for Audi, the Santalop team, by Lucas Legere, Christopher Meese and Patrick Niederhauser. Meese and Niederhauser jumped themselves up into the grid EPI top 10. Meese slides in in 7th and Niederhauser in 10th position. Niederhauser was lurking around the back end of the top 10 for the last few weeks, but he was the highest person in the championship to not have a win. The first 27 people now in the grid EPI have got at least one win to their name. The top uh, half dozen were all in action. Marcello, Gunon, Van Four, and uh, Vietz. They were all in action in that race, as was Mara Engel. But none of them scored any points. So the uh, the guys at the bottom end of the top 10 have edged slightly closer to the top. But Marcello still with two race wins worth of points in the lead ahead of Jules Goudon. They were teammates at the weekend at uh, Hockenheim, but it did not go well for them in the race. Back next week for another Grid EPI update and a results roundup from the weekend. And of course, don't forget Laguna Seca on Sunday, the championship finale. Josh will be covering it on his channel. And myself and Matthew Owens will have coverage of that IndyCar finale over on USRN. Don't forget to check in and check us out on Sunday. Now, back to the guys. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Matt. And we're definitely looking forward to crowning an IndyCar champion on Championship Sunday at WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Sink, and keeping things in the IndyCar family. Team Penske's been very busy lately handing out contract extensions with their current drivers but starting with the nascar side of things they've already re-signed joey logano and ryan blaney now after last weekend's dominating win at portland national raceway team pisky gave indycar driver scott mclaughlin a long-term contract extension in his second full season of racing in the ntt indycar series mclaughlin has three wins three poles and seven podiums and the graphic you see on the screen courtesy of Team Penske. Do you see Scott McLaughlin challenging Joseph Newgarden and Will Power as a top driver at Penske? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think he's doing it right now. You think about this. He came over from a full... You think about it. Scott McLaughlin came over from a from a full bodied series in the Repco Supercar Championship. And he had a really... He had a really good rookie season last year. Look at this year. Yeah. I mean, if he doesn't win the championship this weekend in Port, this weekend in Laguna Seca, you got you got to think he's one of the favorites going into next year. Team Penske with Scott McLaughlin. Joseph Newgarden and Willpower, that team is going to be hard to beat going forward. Yeah, and they've certainly been been hard to beat this year. And as we talked about on the Great Live wrap up show, was with, with Scott McLaughlin been I believe forty forty one points down down to Willpower, who's leading the championship. McLaughlin, he's he's gonna need a lot of help to win this championship. He's gonna basically he's basically gonna need to emulate what he did last weekend at Portland if he wants any realistic shot of winning this championship and then have others have trouble. So McLaughlin's gonna need to roll off the roll off the truck fast. He's gonna need to win the pole. He's gonna need to lead the most laps. He's gonna need to win the race. And then all the others are basically gonna need to fall apart and all finish at the very back of the field. I think we all know the chances of that happening are very very slim, but it's not impossible. We, we've seen crazy things happen before. It would be really remarkable if Scott McLaughlin or Marcus Erickson, two of the outsiders, who are still mathematically eligible, if they end up winning the championship because the elders had issues go wrong, that would certainly be quite remarkable. And I think going into 2023, I think Scott Scott McLaughlin could, could certainly become become the top driver at Team Penske. And like you said, Adam, you could really argue that that, that he's re he's either there now or really really close, but. McLaughlin, he's, he's just been really incredible, and it's remarkable to see how fast a, dr a driver who come from a, a completely different discipline of racing has picked up this type of racing and 
it just shows the type of raw talent that he has and exactly why Brad Pensky decided to bring him from Australia to come race in the United States of America. And on Grit Live Wrap Up a couple of days ago, we discussed Kevin Harvick sounding off on the big fire in his number four Ford Mustang that ended his race. Harvick wasn't happy and voices displeasure with NASCAR, even accusing them of not caring about the problems with the new cup car. However, NASCAR announced changes to address the fire issues that seem to be more common with the Ford Mustangs. The use of intermittent coatings are now permitted for the underside of the car's lower crush panels inside the exhaust cover panels and the upper surface of the rocker box. It is also permitted to apply the coating to the right side stop panel. Intermittent coatings help provide fire protection to steel components, and the changes come after exhaust issues during the cup race at Darlington, the Cookout Southern 500, that ended the nights of Kevin Harvick and J.J. Yaley. Other changes include mandating a lateral seal slash dam to be installed between the back of the front clip weight box and the top of the splitter panel to help reduce the migration of tire debris from the splitter area, and there were also instructions on trimming of the backstop panel included in the most recent rule changes. And Brian Murphy from Stuart Haas Racing shared his response about the new changes that NASCAR proposed at the beginning of this week. Brian says, is this update going to reduce the possibility of a fire? No, but is it going to reduce the amount of material that is flammable if a fire does happen? Yes. And he also adds that NASCAR isn't taking this issue lightly by any means. There were a lot of great conversations today regarding the issue. So there's a response right there from somebody who works in NASCAR who knows what he's talking about. Is it refreshing to see NASCAR making a swift reaction to Harvick's concerns about the fire? Oh, yes, Kobe. I think this is this is refreshing. You know, nobody likes to see a car, a, a race car on fire. So this is this is good for NASCAR. So I applaud NASCAR, what they're doing, and the response from Brian Murphy, I I love it. It is awesome. Um, I I like everything he said. So it so it is refreshing to see these changes happening with the Ford Mustangs. Yeah, yes, it's good to see that NASCAR reacted to to, to that fire after harvest. Very critical comments in there, and and we're hoping that you know, as Brian said, while it won't. While it won't take away, while it won't take away the possibility of you know those fires happening, it will certainly be, be a great measure in place to make sure that we reduce the number of times that that's happening and keep the drivers as safe as we can be. But NASCAR still hasn't addressed the big elephant in the room, which is the hard hits that the drivers are talking about it, with with this new car. And we're and we're certainly hoping that's an issue that's going to be resolved over the off season. Probably not going to be able to do that for these remaining nine races. So a lot of us are going to be holding our breaths when we get to Talladega Super Speedway, but since they'll have some time during the offseason, hopefully there'll be some solutions to make the cars a lot safer. So when the drivers have those hits, they're really hard hits, they're able to walk away, or even hits you don't think that are nearly as bad, the drivers are really feeling them nowadays. And that's something we don't want to see for many years. NASCAR has, all, ha, ha, has always bragged about, you know, being a leader in safety innovation and motorsports moving forward, and rightfully so. They deserve a lot of credit for that. But this year, especially when you hear the drivers talk about the, the the car and, and all the hits that they're suffering, how it really hurts. It seemed like NASCAR's taking a few steps back, so hopefully they'll be able to correct this so they can continue being a champion for safety. Yes, Kobe. I agree. I agree with everything you said. And now there's some news from, from the world of Formula E. After announcing the re-signing of Jake Dennis, the Avalanche and Dreddy Formula E team completed their driver lineup for next season, leaving the Porsche factory lineup. Andre Lauderer now moves over to Andretti, who, who will be using the Porsche powertrains. Antonio Felix da Costa took Lauderer's spot at Porsche, while Lauderer replaces Oliver Askew at Andretti. In 2023, Lauderer will be running a dual program, running in F Formula E with Andretti and racing in sports cars with Porsche's new LMDH program. And the photo you see on the screen, courtesy of Avalanche Andretti. And now it's time for everybody's favorite game here at Grid Network, Pick 
a winner and use the hashtag pick a winner on social media that being said it's time that kobe and i make some some picks so first up the fia world rally championship is back in action this weekend and they're in the country of greece for the legendary acropolis rally holly roman para leads the championship so kobe can can Kali Roman Paris take the victory in Greece. Well, Adam, I'm looking for some easy points to protect my pick a winner points lead. So I'm going to go with the most obvious choice here to win the Acropolis Rally Greece. I think Kali Roman Paris is going to get the job done. And, and it's really crazy because I've said this before. Every time I pick Kali Roman Paris to win, he doesn't. So I'm going to see if, if I'm finally going to get it right with him getting the victory in Greece. Well, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm trying to catch you, so I'm going a different route, and I'm gonna say that Elvin Evans gets the job done in Greece. And next, the Repco Supercar Championship leaves Australia and heads to New Zealand, home, home to points leader Shane Van Gisbergen, and they're at the legendary Pukekohe Park Raceway, a track that. That Scott McLaughlin got his first career supercars victory at, and former supercar champion and Bathurst 1000 champion Greg Murphy at one time was known as the king of Puka Koe. So Kobe, can Shane Van Gisbergen get a get a win on home soil in race one? Adam. Yeah, yes, he will. Shane Van Gisberg and Sharpie, and he's probably he's probably gonna be my pick for the rest of the races this weekend in New Zealand. Even though I'm trying to catch you, I I gotta agree. I mean, Shane Van Gisberg right now is the dominant driver in the Repco Supercars Championship, so you gotta go with SVG. And we have a comment here from IG saying, I think Scott can challenge Joseph once he gets that killer instinct but that he currently is lacking. He will be extremely hard to beat. Oh, yeah. I agree with that completely. And, Kobe, you have some news about some huge news that could be coming tomorrow from NASCAR. Mm. Oh, oh, yes, there's going to be some a, a, a huge announcement tomorrow coming from NASCAR. And for this special announcement and discussion, we're going to bring in Grit Live Encores, Ben Snyder. Really glad to have you on, Ben. I know this is a topic you're very passionate about. And tomorrow, major announcement at the North Carolina History Museum in Raleigh, North Carolina, for, at, from SMI Speedway Motorsports. And on the list of people who are attended to be there, the leader of SMI, Marcus Smith himself, Dale Earnhardt Jr., who, who actually just tweeted an aerial shot of North Woodsboro Speedway, the governor of North Carolina, Roy Cooper, NASCAR Steve O'Donnell, and Greg Walter from Charlotte Motor Speedway. And, and it's interesting wa watching this story unfold all day, seeing all the dominoes fall into place. The, originally, North Woodsboro was going to tear up the asphalt this month and run some dirt race in October, but they announced earlier today that's been canceled. They've abandoned racing. On the dirt, and this comes as Motorsports.com reports that the 2023 NASCAR Cup Series All-Star Race will take place at North Wilkesboro Speedway. And starting with you, Ben, just want to get your reaction to this of these later, this latest development and the big announcement that's expected tomorrow with NASCAR returning to North Wilkesboro. Kobe Adam, this is an unbelievable day. This is such a great day for NASCAR. This is such a great day for motorsports as a whole, but particularly, this is an unbelievable day for motorsports historians and people who value the history of tracks like North Wilkesboro, who value the roots of the sport and where NASCAR came from. This has been something that has exceeded everybody's wildest dreams and expectations. I don't think anybody ever even thought that this was a remote possibility as little as one month ago when we were just starting to see uh, some late model races and local racing be brought back to the track as part of its racetrack revival. And I don't even know where to begin. There's so many people that we have to thank and so many uh, people have been working so hard to bring this track back to restore the speedway and to preserve the speedway, prevent it from being bulldozed or prevent it from having nature take it back, prevent it from just sitting there 
And like I said, I, I never would have expected something like this for NASCAR to not only be making a return, but to bring to be bringing the Cup Series back and the All-Star Race. And how ironic is it that the track that took North Wilkesboro Speedway's date originally in 1997, Texas Motor Speedway, the All-Star Race now moves from Texas back to North Wilkesboro. It's absolutely unbelievable what's happening here. And I, like I said, I don't think anybody even could have anticipated that we'd get this far this quickly. Just three years ago, Dale Earnhardt Jr. kind of said on a whim, I've got the keys to the track. Let's go scan it for iRacing so that at least we have a digital copy of it preserved for the future. Nobody was ever thinking that this was a remote possibility at all. And so quickly, we've seen the movement continue to grow and grow stronger. And now the racetrack is back. The speedway has been saved. What we saw last week was an incredible success that I think also exceeded everybody's expectations. And to go from in the span of just a few months, maybe we'll have a truck race in 2024 to the all-star race next year. Are you kidding me? This is an unbelievable day for NASCAR and all credit to them for putting this together. And I cannot wait to see how it turns out next season. If this announcement is true tomorrow, I'm getting my ticket and I will and I will go to the All-Star Race at North Wilkesboro in 2023. I want I've gone to the All-Star Race at Charlotte Motor Speedway. I've gone to the All-Star Race at Bristol Motor Speedway in 2020. So um this is incredible. This is huge news for, for NASCAR for motorsports in the mountains of North Carolina. I can almost hear J- Junior Johnson saying, Yeah, it's the right time. And um, in something from from Adam Stern's Twitter page from Fox Sports, B- Bill Wagner, he said one thing we've one thing we've talked to NASCAR about is trying to move the Australia to different locations, the same way other sports like baseball do. We think it's a we think it's we just think that it's a way to keep the race fresh, exciting for people, and bring in some new locations. So, I mean, NASCAR returning to North Wilkesboro for the All-Star Race. Oh, boy. It, these tickets are going to sell out quick. And something else that Adam Stern put out on his Twitter page an hour ago he said after Speedway Motorsports makes the all-star race announcement tomorrow NASCAR could release the full 2023 schedule as soon as next week so if you're a NASCAR fan you're watching this if if North Wilkesboro Speedway does host the all-star race next year get your tickets now because this is huge news from NASCAR in all of Mars Bars. This is what the fans wanted to see. So let's get it on. Yeah, let's get it on. And got a comment here from Joe San Diego said, You were so sad when it went away. Remember the doubters, and now the potential news is amazing. You say your hope is true and not another disappointing NFT announcement like Tony Stewart. Yeah, we certainly we certainly hope that it's not that, but I but I have a feeling, given all the credible sources and reporting out there, that this that this is absolutely true. And uh, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. tweeting a random aerial shot of North Wilkesboro Speedway under the lights at night. That's certainly an indication that this is headed exactly where we think it's headed. So it's it's certainly a really exciting time, and I'll and I'll gladly eat the crow that I said on Twitter several years ago i said i wish people would stop talking about north wilkesboro speedway returning yes we like to have it back but that track is too far gone it's been taken by nature and we just need to move on to bigger and better things in modern times and i'm i'm really glad to eat crow on that one i never thought in a million years that it was possible to bring this track back back, back from the dead and for Dell and hart jr you have, have to give a lot of credit to him and marcus smith from smi and everybody at nascar for making this whole project possible and it just shows even even when you think it's all over it's not over until it's over and they, they stuck with the they stuck with this and this is this is bigger than we expected we just we, you know you know they just finished up with the with the late model races and and all of that at north wilkesboro that was a great success they had a packed house when Dell Hart jr ran the car ran, ran, ran the car's late model tour race there 
and that was that was really an exciting atmosphere. Junior got out of the car. He he was smiling from from ear to ear, and it was such an incredible thing because Junior, he you could see deep down in his heart how much that truly meant to him. And Joe Samniego says that the Cars Three movie is coming true. I I totally agree with that, Joe. Totally to, 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 totally agree. And 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 after seeing North Wilkesboro coming back at, to the NASCAR Cup Series schedule as as soon as next year. And it's just unbelievable to see how this track has come back from. I remember looking at the photos of how bad that nature had taken this track, and now it's back just like that. And, Ben, this is a follow-up I have for you. Is there any hope for Nazra? <laughs> oh, Kobe, I hope so. I mean, I didn't think there was any hope for North Wilkesboro. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still holding on to a glimmer of hope there. And, uh, you know, not just because I'm a local. I know Nazareth is a two-hour drive from me. I would love to bring that track back. But, unfortunately – yeah, it's going to take even more to bring uh, Nazareth back when it did North Wilkesboro because at the bare minimum, North Wilkesboro had a caretaker for many, many years, and there were efforts to at least kind of try to preserve it and make sure it didn't totally get taken back by nature, and uh, that's left it in condition where clearly it's been possible now these last couple of years to bring it back, but this is part of why I was so passionate about this, and I, I never, like I said, I never thought that we would get this far this quickly. But I've seen what happened to Nazareth, and I, I've been to Nazareth Speedway myself, and I, I, I cannot believe just how much damage and destruction has been done by it just sitting there for what, whatever it's been now, 18 years since the last race. So, you know, to, to see that happen in Nazareth, I did not want the same fate to, to take on to North Wilkesboro. And, you know, I, I wanted at the bare minimum, is, is there any way we can, you know, set up a museum or set up, you know, some sort of you know, way to preserve the history of a track without totally condemning the facility. Even if we're not going to bring racing back, we can we can have something here to remember where the sport came from and how the sport got started. I mean, North Wilkesboro Speedway is one of the original tracks uh, on the NASCAR calendar from way back in its very first season. And it's it's unbelievable. Like, I, I mean, I feel like I keep talking in circles here, but I, I just I'm on cloud nine hearing this announcement today. You know, it's it's a great, great day. And, you know, Nazareth Speedway is probably too far gone. But, you know, if this if this can happen, I'm convinced anything is possible now. I mean, this this is absolutely unreal. And to have it happen so quickly as well. And it's not it's not even like if this were an ARCA race, if this were an ARCA East race, if this were a truck race, I mean, I'd be feeling the same way. But to have the Cup Series, I know it's just an exhibition race with the All-Star race, but the Cup Series to be back in North Wilkesboro Speedway, that would have been unimaginable as recently as just a month ago to, to have this all happen so quickly is just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, Ben. And I can remember when the IndyCar series ran at Nazareth, it was known as the Bosch spark plug grand prix. And even the net, even the Xfinity series back then called the Bush series, they ran the day after the all-star race up there. Even the modifieds ran there at Nazareth. So, I mean, it was an, it was a nice oval. I mean, it was cool to see, you know, you know some of the great names that have run there. I mean, it's it. I mean, it, you think about it. It's in the Andretti's backyard. That that's where they grew up. So, I mean, I mean, anything can happen. I mean, I think it'd be cool to, to have someone uh, re. It'd be cool if someone could bring back Nazareth Speedway to what we used to know it as. I mean, we all can dream, can't we? Well, I'll say this much. If Dale Jr. is looking for another project, maybe you can call up a guy named Mario and see if they can make something happen. But Oh, you know, oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh. The Andretti connection, who, who, knows what, who, who knows what might be possible? I think we have a comment from Joe as well about uh, something, one, of his, one of the tracks in his neck of the woods there, a cup to Portland. Who knows? Yeah. Why not? Why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? I know a lot. I know a lot of people in in the NASCAR industry saying that Portland, Portland is certainly a great location. But I feel like to accommodate the Cup Series, I'll certainly need to be some upgrades to uh, to the facility. And and if Portland really wants a Cup race, they'll find a way to make those upgrades. They they did it for Road America for a while. They said that Road America needed to make upgrades for a Cup race. Road America did that. Got on the Cup calendar until it wasn't. With, with Chicago Street Race replacing it next year, but we could see Road America back on the Cup schedule in the future with NASCAR make making a lot of different changes, testing out new markets. I could see I could see the Cup Series going to the Pacific Northwest and trying out 
Portland National Race. So I know the Xfinity race was really, really wet, really wild. But if but if they choose choose it during the right time of year where we're hopefully not dealing with a lot of rain, certainly I could I could see that been a strong possibility possibility. And, and, and Joe said very, very true. And, and if you guys don't have anything else to add, I, b- I believe that'll be it for tonight's episode of Grit Tonight. So please be sure to like and subscribe to Grit Network here on YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. We definitely encourage you to take five minutes after our show if you like what you saw and c- consider joining our Patreon Invest in Grit Network to keep us on the air well into the future. Do you want to buy me a coffee? Click the link in the video description below and you can buy a drink for your favorite on our talent here at Grit Network. Big shout out to Edward Hunter from Formerly Zone, Amber and Zachary for buying us a coffee. We really appreciate it. Any amount will help us continue growing our motorsports media outlet. Visit public.com, also known as the stock market social media home. The link below and referral code GRITNET gives you $5 to invest immediately. Public.com allows you to connect with your friends. You can make new friends and use tools to learn how to properly invest in the stock market. And our schedule for the upcoming week, please ch- check out the new episode of Women in Motorsports later this week. Then Saturday, we're going to be on the air, Grit Live pre-race at noon Eastern. And Sunday, Grit Live wrap-up, 90 minutes after the NASCAR Cup Series race at Kansas Speedway, including the crowning of an IndyCar champion on Championship Sunday at WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Senko. Looking forward to seeing which driver is going to be crowned champion in IndyCar. For Ben Snyder and, and Adam Lemmerys, I'm Kobe Lambert from the From the party of finish thing. Thank you. Don't be an anonymous investor. Join the stock market social media platform public.com. Invest any amount of money and share with friends and new friends. Discover new opportunities, such as new companies and potential business partners, and useful tools for beginners and share your experience with friends on public.com. Link in the video description gets you $5 for being a Grid Network viewer. Use the referral code GRIDNET for your free $5 to invest. Start investing and networking on public.com.